we are going to begin the study of second order partial differential equations. In this lecture, we are going to study about special curves associated to uh, second order partial differential equation. So, the outline for today is uh, we start with some illustrative examples exactly like how we started off our study of first order partial differential equations where uh, in lecture 2.1 we looked at three Cauchy problems which exhibited all the three possibilities for the number of solutions. Uh, unique solution when the data is datum curve is of certain type and when it is of another type it was uh, either 0 solutions or infinitely many solutions. Then we will make an attempt to solve a Cauchy problem for a second order quasi linear PDE. Okay, so, second order quasi linear PDE in two independent variables the most general such equation is of this form a u x x plus 2 b u x y plus c u y y plus d equal to 0, where a b c d are functions of uh, 5 variables. So, they are defined on an open subset omega 5 of r 5. So, in the above equation we refer to that as 2 q l second order quasi linear equation. We suppress the dependence of a b c d on uh, x y u u x u y otherwise the equation will be very long. When it is understood there is no need to repeat it. So, that is why the dependence is suppressed here. So, A stands for A of x y u u x u y etcetera. Now, second order linear PDE we will consider this also in this chapter. In fact, the second part of this chapter will be exclusively dealing with second order linear PDE and a general such general form of such equation is here. So, we refer to that as 2 L second order linear partial differential equation. So, let us look at some illustrative examples. Let us start with this uh, second order partial differential equation u x x equal to 0. I have to mention it is in two independent variables because it is not clear from the equation. So, its general solution we can write down this is actually a ODE in with respect to x. Therefore, when you integrate first time u x of x y will be constant with respect to x. So, it will be some arbitrary function of y that is k 1 y. You integrate once more you get u x y equal to k 1 y x plus k 2 y. See solutions of u x x equal to 0 are straight lines if it is a ODE. Straight line will have a they look like a x plus b. Now, because this there is a y variable involved a and b will be functions of y also. Now, what are k 1 and k 2? k 2 of y if I want to find out I need to uh, finish this term kill this term. So, I put x equal to 0 that means u of 0 y this term is gone what remains is k 2 y. So, k 2 y is nothing but u of 0 y and what is k 1 y? that looks obvious you are differentiate with respect to x and uh, ux of x y in fact is uh, k 1 y, but I am taking x equal to 0 to be uniform with this. Because later on we are going to look at uh, uh, prescribing conditions to solve ux x equal to 0 conditions like our uh, Cauchy data that we have seen in first order PDE. Therefore, let it be u 0 y and u x 0 y then what we get is k 1 y and k 2 y. So, therefore, this analysis shows that you have complete freedom to prescribe u of 0 y and u x of 0 y if you want to solve u x x equal to 0. Now, let us look go to the second example equation is the same we are not changing the equation u x x equal to 0 therefore, the general solution continues to be the same. Now, suppose we want to prescribe u of x 0 arbitrarily what should be that? Can we do it? Is that allowed by the equation? Because this equation immediately the solution is coming like this right. So, therefore, asking this question is same as asking whether equation allows us. So, what is u x 0? When I put u x 0 y equal to 0 I get k 1 0 times x plus k 2 0. 
So, it is not allowed by the equation you cannot have arbitrary functions. Ux0 must look like Ax plus b for some real numbers a and b. Okay, let us prescribe Ux0 equal to Ax plus b. Okay. Prescribing Ux0 equal to Ax plus b means that k10 is a, k20 is b, we just saw that on the previous slide. So, since Ux0 equal to Ax plus b, the derivative of u with respect to x is determined on the x axis, Ux x0 will turn out to be a. So, there is no way that we can prescribe Ux at, at on the line x0, it is not possible. Then we ask the question can we prescribe ui in that case, ui of x comma 0, let us find out. So, ui of x0 from this general solution will look like this now, derivative with respect to y that means k1 dash y x plus k2 dash y, when y equal to 0 it is k1 dash 0 times x plus k2 dash 0. This means even ui of x comma 0 must be like cx plus d, it must be linear function for some constant cd in r. So, therefore, to conclude we have the following two scenarios when ux0 and ui x0 are prescribed. What are they? This is just to recall that the general solution is this for ux x equal to 0. What are the two scenarios? Prescribe ux0 equal to ax plus b and u x 0 equal c x plus d. Okay. Now, prescribing u x 0 equal to x plus b fixes the values of k 1 and k 2 at the points at the point 0 x equal to 0, k 1 0 is a and k 2 0 is b. Now, the other condition u y of x 0 equal to c x plus d that fixes k 1 dash 0 equal to c, k 2 dash 0 equal to d. Therefore, there are infinitely many solutions to the Cauchy problem because these two conditions namely u x 0 equal to a x plus b and u y x 0 equal to c x plus d does not determine both k 1 and k 2 the functions. What are all the things which are determined by this condition are simply the values of the function and the derivative at the point 0 for both k 1 and k 2. So, you have so many functions which satisfy these criteria that is why you have infinitely many solutions. Now, the second scenario is at least one of them you have not prescribed as a linear function. What will happen? No solutions, no solution to the Cauchy problem. So, if you compare both the examples, P d is the same in both the examples namely u x x equal to 0. When Cauchy data is given on y axis, solution is unique when Cauchy data is given on x axis, two possibilities exist, infinitely many solutions or no solutions. So, recall the three Cauchy problem that we considered in lecture 2.1 for first order PDEs, where we had uh, similar observations. The curves gamma 2 which give rise to 0 or infinite number of solutions turned out to be a special curves for the PDE and these curves were called base characteristic curves later on. Now, the natural questions are, are there special curves for every second order PDE, how many will be there, how to find them. Next few lectures are devoted to finding answers to these questions. So, solving uh, Cauchy problems for second order PDEs, uh, we cover some preliminaries. So, we are going to pose a Cauchy problem and then implement a classical strategy to solve that. Before posing Cauchy problem, we need to introduce a few terminology, we are going to do that. So, let gamma 2 denote a planar curve described parametrically by gamma 2 x equal to f s y equal to g s s in i, where i is an interval in r and f g are c 1 functions. Further assume that gamma 2 is a regular curve, what does that mean? For every s in i f dash g dash is not equal to 0 0 and geometrically speaking gamma 2 possesses a well defined tangent at each of its points. We have come across the notion of a regular curve even in the context of first order PDEs. Let n of f s g s 
denote the unit normal to gamma 2 at the point Fsgs in gamma 2. Fsgs is a point on gamma 2 and n denotes the unit normal to gamma 2 at that point defined by this because unit normal is not unique ok. It will be uh, there will be two choices for example, if this is your gamma 2 ok, this is the tangential direction and what you have here is the normal direction ok. So, plus or minus of each other we do not care which one we are taking uh, for this problem it should be given by this we are giving the formula here n f s g s equal to this. Notice this is well defined if the denominator is not 0 that is precisely the assumption of the regular curve. <coughs> so, we are now ready to state the Cauchy problem given two functions we will see where they appear h and chi. Cauchy problem for the second order quasi linear equation consists of finding a C2 function that is twice continuously differential function such that u is a solution to the PDE which is a second order quasi linear equation 2 QL and u satisfies the two conditions u of fsgs equal to hs <coughs> that means u is prescribed on point at points of gamma 2 as h of s and dou u by dou n which is called the normal derivative of u is also prescribed as chi s at every point of gamma 2. So, suppose this is your gamma 2 and you take a point here at this point this point is like f, f s g s this is how points look on gamma 2 you are prescribing what should be the value of u at this point. and you are also prescribing dou u by dou n at this point the normal derivative. Why not any other derivative that question we will uh, discuss at the end of this lecture why not any other derivative. So, actually if you see the normal direction is like that right ok or maybe any, any of the direction let us take this side you can actually define the directional derivative in any direction that can be prescribed. So, what can be prescribed is dou u by dou uh, v that can be prescribed that is also fine. What all you should not prescribe is the in the direction of the tangent you should not prescribe. If you recall if you consider u x 0 equal to some function uh, h x u x is already determined. Okay, so, therefore, you cannot uh, prescribe this uh, with freedom and what is u x x 0? It is a directional derivative of u in the direction 1 comma 0 that is the direction of the x axis. So, that is what is called a tangential derivative. Okay. And at every point the direction of the tangent and the normal they will be linearly independent. So, you can prescribe two derivatives, but one derivative tangential derivative is already determined if you have prescribed the function u. Therefore, there is you this you cannot prescribe. Therefore, any other directional derivative we can prescribe where v is independent of the direction 1 0, but to be very clear we are uh, prescribing on a normal because tangent and a direction which is immediately connected to a tangential direction is a direction perpendicular to that which is the normal direction. So, that is why we prescribe dou u by dou m that is a secret you can prescribe any other derivative also. And we require as usual the condition should be met for s belonging to a sub interval of phi which means we are looking at local with respect to data kind of solution. So, geometrically speaking if you define a space curve gamma in R 3 by by putting z equal to h s ok, we get gamma 2 will be the projection of gamma 2 x y plane and the surface z equal to u x y defined by 
solution or the Cauchy problem will contain a part of this gamma. Okay, now we discuss a classical strategy to solve the Cauchy problem. The goal is to find solution to Cauchy problem near points of gamma 2 because functions will be defined in a neighborhood of gamma 2. The same thing was true for the first order partial differential equations also. So, take a point on gamma 2 p naught in terms of x and y you may call x naught y naught in terms of the parameter running on the gamma 2 f s naught g s naught. Determine derivatives of all orders of a possible solution at p naught. Determine derivatives of all orders. Propose a Taylor series around the point p 0 using the information on derivatives at p naught. What information do we need uh, to propose a Taylor series of a function? All the derivatives at a particular point in this case p naught that you have determined in the, this step determine all the derivatives. So, Taylor series can be proposed and hoping that the series converges and it would be a solution to the Cauchy problem that is the hope one needs to prove that. This is the essential idea behind the proof of cauchy kowalski theorem for details you may consult the book of partial differential equations by Fridjohn you will find the details there. So, in other words somebody comes to you and tells, tells you that boss I know that this Cauchy problem has a solution which can be expressed in Taylor series format. It has a Taylor series expansion in other words he is telling you that solution is real analytic. Now, your job is only to find that to find that what all you need to do is find all partial derivatives of the function at the point p 0. If you can determine them uniquely then you caught hold of all the derivatives and propose that series Taylor series. And since somebody told you that he has a Taylor series expansion you hope that this will be solution to that. But to implement this strategy we would require the data in the problem namely the a b c d to be smooth to be as many times differentiable as we want. Similarly, f g and h which are prescribed functions or maybe h and chi yeah f g are determined defined by gamma 2 gamma 2 is defined by f g and then we are given the Cauchy data in terms of h and chi. So, all of this of course, we need to assume are c infinity functions then only we can implement this strategy. We limit ourselves to just computation of all derivatives we are going to enquire into the possibilities of computing all derivatives at a point p 0 can we do it or not whether somebody stops us from doing that if so who is that we will identify. Of course, we have no a priori knowledge of the solution the person who told there may be a solution is not given as the formula. So, that I can compute derivative using the function no it is not that you are given a function and then find its Taylor series it is not the case. You are thinking that there is a solution which has a Taylor series expansion and you are trying to find out if such is the case what are the derivatives and what is available to you is only the Cauchy data and the PDE these are the only two things that you can use no nothing else. So, we do not discuss the convergence aspects of the formal Taylor series which, which needs to be proposed after computing the partial derivatives of all orders. So, for implementing this strategy we need to assume that all the functions involved in the Cauchy problem namely a b c d f g h chi are c infinity that means they have derivatives of all orders. Now, we are going to drop the subscript 0 in s 0 and we write s with understanding that it is fixed, but otherwise arbitrary in i. Now, let us see the computation of first order derivatives using only the Cauchy data and the p d and for brevity in notations let us introduce u x at a point f s g s and gamma 2 as p s similarly u y at a point f s g s as q s. So, these function are defined on gamma 2 we are just introducing we do not know u x u y yet we need to determine u x u y. So, using these notations the normal derivative condition takes this form 
minus p g prime plus q f prime by root f dash square plus g dash square equal to chi s. And dou u by dou n is gradient u dot n, gradient u is u x and u i dot n is minus g prime f prime divided by root f dash square plus g dash square that is why we get this equation. Solution must satisfy H s equal to u of f s g s f s u of f s g s also right. So, let us differentiate this equation because we want to get an equation for p s and q s. So, we differentiate this apply chain rule. So, from here we get this, but u x is p s u y is q s therefore, that is p s f dash plus q s g dash s. So, we have got one more equation. So, we had one equation on the previous slide and one more equation on this slide. Both of them are linear with respect to p s, p s q s. So, let us recall both the equations in one place. Look we want to determine p s and q s. This is one linear equation featuring p s q s f prime g prime h prime are known. Here also g prime f prime and chi are known. So, this is also a known linear equation in p and q. The coefficient matrix is invertible. What is the coefficient matrix? The first equation is f prime of s, g prime of s, second one is minus g prime of s divided by square root of f prime square plus g prime square and here it is f prime by square root of f prime square plus g prime square into p s q s this is the system equal to h prime into chi not chi into h prime and chi. Now, what is the determinant of this? It is f prime square plus g prime square divided by square root of f prime square g prime s square therefore, determinant is equal to square root of f prime square plus g prime square and that is not equal to 0 due to the regularity of the curve. So, therefore, there is exactly one solution for p s and q s. So, we can find p s and q s. uniquely. <coughs> so, both the first order partial derivatives have been determined at all points of gamma 2 with this. In fact, we are interested in determining at some point of gamma 2 that we have fixed since the point is arbitrary we are saying at any point in gamma 2. Using only the Cauchy data the PD did not play any role. So, the remark computation of first order derivatives at points of gamma 2 required the knowledge of u and its normal derivative on gamma 2 only. This is not surprising. The Cauchy data contains information on directional derivatives of u in two independent directions. What are they? They are tangential through u of f s g s equal to h s normal through the normal derivative which is given explicitly. Since information on tangential derivative is inbuilt in this condition u of, s, u of f s g s equal to h s, one needed to prescribe derivative in any other direction which is non tangential. This is what we discussed at the beginning of this lecture. For definiteness, we have used normal direction, that is all. The partial derivatives are directional derivatives in two coordinate directions. For a differentiable function, knowledge of any two directional derivatives of course, directions must be linearly independent that is enough to determine any other directional derivative as this map is a linear functional on R2. We going to dVU that is the directional derivative of u in the direction of V at the point P. So, P is fixed then the mapping V going to dVU at P is a linear functional. Which is fully determined once its values on a basis is known. At any point on gamma 2, the tangential and normal directions are always linearly independent. 
Now let us look at computation of second order derivatives. Here we need to use a PDE. We have determined the first order derivatives at all points of gamma 2 that is ux of fsgs and ui of fsgs. We call them ps and qs. On differentiating with respect to s, we get p prime of s equal to uxx into f prime s plus uxy into g prime s. Similarly, we get this expression for q prime s. Note here that the LHS p prime s and q prime s is known because the p and s are known functions this is known. f prime and g prime are anyway known. So, what are unknowns here uxx, uxy and uyy. Note that we are not making any distinction between uxi, uxy and uyx. Why? Because we are planning to compute all the derivatives and then propose a formal power series expansions for the solution. Therefore, we are assuming that solution is smooth and for smooth functions the mixed, or mixed partial derivatives do not depend on the order in which you take the derivatives. So, thus in conclusion 3 and 4 represent 2 equations, 2 linear equations in the 3 unknowns. Therefore, it will be nice to have one more equation so that we can hope to determine the unknown quantities namely the second order partial derivatives of u along the curve gamma 2. So, the equations 3 and 4 feature 3 unknowns which are uxx, uxy, uyy. It would be nice to have another equation satisfied by these unknowns so that we can hope to determine them. The PDE, the second order quasi linear PDE gives us a third equation because PDE is an expression for some combination of second order partial derivatives. Thus we have a u x x plus 2 b u x y plus c u y y equal to minus d. I have written in this form I have taken d to the other side because I wanted to write finally a system of linear equations for the unknown quantities. Where zeta s is f s g s h s p s q s. So, the equations 3, 4, 5 may be written as the linear system. In this linear system notice this is these are known quantities the matrix on the right hand side is known, known function of s. Therefore, we can determine uniquely these quantities provided this determinant is non-zero. What is the determinant of this matrix? Let us denote it by delta of s because it keeps coming uh, throughout this lecture. It has this expression once you expand this determinant it turns out it is this is it is this. Observe that the system of linear equations on the last slide determine all the second order partial derivatives if delta s is not equal to 0 at points of gamma 2. Wherever it is non-zero you can determine the second order derivatives at that point. So, from now onwards assume that the above condition is satisfied. Now, let us look go, go to the computation of third and higher order derivatives. How the second order partial derivatives are computed if you look at PDE determines a combination of second order derivatives of u along gamma 2 fine. Second thing is knowledge of first order derivatives of u on gamma 2 yields another 2 relations when we differentiate that with respect to s. So, that that is how we got the 3 equations and we could get all the 3 second order partial derivatives. Now, if you want to repeat the above process what you need is a PDE uh, which gives a combination of third order derivatives. How will you get that? Differentiate the PDE. If you differentiate the PDE with respect to x or y, you will get a new PDE which has the third order derivatives in it. Fine. And now a second order derivatives we know on gamma 2. Therefore, if you differentiate that, that will give you some more relations which involve third order derivatives of u. PDE satisfied by third order partial derivatives we want to find. So, let us differentiate the given quasi linear equation with respect to x. So, by product rule it turns out to be 
this. Okay. Notice the, the third order partial derivatives are appearing here and their coefficients are A to B and C which are exactly the coefficients in the given equation. And this is nothing special for differentiation with respect to just uh, x, it will also be the same when you differentiate this with respect to y. There will be a third order derivatives, a different third order derivatives, but coefficients are a to b and c. Even if you differentiate it 10 times, even then uh, you will get, if suppose you differentiate 10 times, then you get an equation which is uh, a 12th, uh, 12th order derivatives, but with same coefficients a to b and c this will not change. Okay. So, after differentiating we get this equation. Now, we need to explain slightly what this notation stands for. Notice here a or a, b, c, d they are all functions of x, y, u of x, y, u x of x, y, u y of x, y. So, that we are differentiating with respect to x that is why we have written this kind of notation. So, let us introduce what this notation is. So, it is dou phi by dou x. Uh, for any function uh, phi a or b or c or d what it stands for is this dou by dou x of phi of x y u of x y u x of x y u y of x y. So, from the, the p d that we obtained after differentiating the given p d with respect to x it follows that a u triple x plus 2 b u double x y plus c u x double y namely this this is a known function along gamma 2 or this is a known function of s provided the rest of the things are known functions of s. Notice here a, b, c, d are known functions and the second order partial derivatives u x x, u x y, u y y have already been determined along gamma 2 therefore they are known functions. And on the next slide we are going to show that dou by dou x phi for any of these functions a, b, c, d is a known function of s. And then it follows that these are all known functions of s and hence this quantity is a known function of s. That means this particular combination of u triple x, u double x y and u x double y is known function of s. Okay, take any function phi in a, b, c, d what is this? This by chain rule is exactly this differentiate phi with respect to x at this point zeta s differentiate phi with respect to the third variable which we are calling z and then that is u. So, u derivative of u with respect to x that is why u x and phi this is p this is q. So, phi p and phi q and this is u x therefore, it is u double x this is u y therefore, it is u x y. Therefore, this is a known function of s. The conclusion is that u a u triple x plus 2 b u x x y plus c u x y y is a known function of s. What is remaining is u triple y that is not appearing here. For that we need to work separately we will discuss that later. The following system of uh, equations holds for the third order derivatives at the point f s g s in gamma 2. See we knew u x x, u x y, u y y as a function of s these are been already determined therefore, we can differentiate them d by d s, d by d s, d by d s. So, earlier for the first order derivatives we called p q as u x and u y. Now, we can call r s and t, but it will introduce new notations I want to avoid that that is why I am retaining it as it is. But by chain rule this quantity is given in terms of a combination of third order partial derivatives of u. So, this we can get this expression. So, here all third order partial derivatives are evaluated at this point zeta of s. The functions on the LHS are known because we know all the second order partial derivatives of u along gamma 2. So, they are all known functions of s and hence their derivatives. And on the right hand side we know f prime g prime the only thing we do not know is the third order partial derivatives which we are trying to determine. So, the system of linear equations given by 7a, 7b and 6, 6 is the equation that we obtained after differentiating the given equation with respect to x and the 7a and 7b are the first two equations on this slide. 
and the right hand sides are all known functions. I am not writing explicitly what they are because that is not uh, important for us. What we need to know is these are known functions. These are the unknown functions which we are trying to determine and this matrix is interesting because exactly the same matrix that appeared in the computation of second order partial derivatives. And we have assumed that is invertible therefore we can determine all these 3 uh, derivatives. Now we had an option of writing equations u triple y also featuring so we can write 4 equations but for this reason I avoided that this is convenient for us u triple y we will do similarly how to find u triple y ok. So thus u triple x u double x y u x y y are determined along gamma 2 what remains is to find u triple y how do you get that? many ways one of them is do the same procedure instead of differentiating the PDE with respect to x differentiate with respect to y and consider the last two equations on that slide where we had the three equations the equations which came out of differentiating second order derivatives along gamma. So exactly same computations you repeat otherwise uh, differentiate the given PD with respect to y and then in that only u triple y will, will be unknown rest of the third order derivatives have already been determined. So therefore you can determine u triple y. Of course you would need that the coefficient multiplying u triple y is non-zero what that can be done. So the procedure described above can be continued indefinitely and all higher order derivatives of u may be determined. There is no need to impose any more assumptions on gamma 2 other than requiring delta s not equal to 0 that is important. Of course you need all these functions to be infinitely differentiable. Now what are the curves gamma 2 for which delta s is identically equal to 0? This is a natural important question because such curves will prevent you from doing these computations ok. We may not be able to determine the second order derivatives if delta s is identically equal to 0 or even if you are able to determine it is not unique. So we do not say it is determined uniquely right. So there is a trouble if delta s is identically equal to 0. What does that mean? It just means this, this is the equation equal to 0 for every s in i. In example 2 p d is u x x equal to 0, gamma 2 is x axis delta s is identically equal to 0 holds ok and we saw the trouble there either there is no solution or infinitely many solutions. Now how to find these curves how to determine these curves of course here the equation that we have is in terms of the parameter yes. So now how do I find such curves? in x y plane unfortunately it involves h s p s and q s ok because we have considered the quasi linear equations. So therefore if you consider it is a linear equation it is much easy ok assume that gamma 2 is the graph of a function for example x equal to xi of y then gamma 2 will be x equal to f s which is now xi s and y equal to g s which is s then this equation becomes this equation. Of course, still zeta s is there. So when the equation is linear, then c zeta s does not depend on uh, phi quantities. It only depends on the first two quantities, which is x and y, f s and g s. So writing in terms of x and y, we get this equation. This is an ordinary differential equation, first order, but degree two. There is a power two here. So d z by d y maybe one can compute uh, using the formula of the solutions of quadratic equations and you are likely to get uh, 2 equations likely to you may not get we will see that later. In forthcoming lectures we will discuss about solutions of this equation. So let us summarize what we did a formal procedure to solve Cauchy problems breaks down if gamma 2 is a special curve. One might ask why did we consider second order quasi linear equation for this discussion simply because most general equations for which the method can be carried out 
or quasilinear equations. That is why we have done for quasilinear equations. For general nonlinear equations, we cannot do. Okay, that A, if you remember, A depended only zeta s. Zeta s is already known the moment you compute the first order derivatives. So, whenever you differentiate as many number of times as you want the partial differential equation, the highest order partial derivatives are always multiplied with A, 2B, and C, which are known functions. And as a result, the linear system that we, we may write from time to time will be the same whose determinant will always be delta s. So, that is the advantage. Since we could do, we have done it for quasilinear equations. And the questions on special curves and their consequences will be important for the second order quasilinear equations also. We will uh, come across them later. Interestingly, we will run into special curves for PD in a different context also, which we will see in the next lecture. In forthcoming lectures for linear PDEs, we will try to find answers. Uh, we will try to find answers to the following questions. What are the do special curves exist for any second order linear equation? If yes, how to find them? How many of them exist, etc. So, in the next lecture, we will take up another context where delta s makes an appearance. Delta s identically equal to 0 will become important. Thank you.